Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and to being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 133, and it's on the tutors and travel. But first, I just want to give my little piece of admin slash ad. We had TutorCon a couple of weeks ago, and it was so much fun. We had three days of amazing friendships that were formed. The costumes were unbelievable. You guys went so way out on the costumes. It was crazy. And we had entertainers. We had speakers. We had a lot of, we saw live music. It was just really amazing. So if you missed it and you had FOMO, we're going to do it again next year, October 2nd through 4th in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania at a beautiful winery just next to the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair. And for the rest of the year, you can get $50 off the regular ticket with the early bird price, but also stay tuned next week because I'm going to have a really good Black Friday special going on. Um, all next week leading up to Cyber Monday. And so the tickets are going to be even more discounted and you're going to get a special gift. So you're going to want to go to englandcast.com slash tutorcon2020 to get your ticket for that and to learn more and find out all the information you need to know about it. October 2nd through 4th. Also, it makes a fantastic gift. So if you want to kind of leave some hints for people who might be looking for a gift for you, that would be great. And because there's nothing really to put under the tree with the TutorCon ticket, if you order during the Black Friday, Cyber Monday special deal, I'm also going to send you a card so you can put that under the tree as well. So um, that's my little note on TutorCon. And also at my shop, tutorfair.com, I've got some really cool new designs. There's some Christmas stuff. There's a really cool magic mug. Um, There's a cool new all over print shirt that replicates Anne Boleyn's famous outfit in her portrait with her bee necklace. So there's some really cool stuff. And again, I'm going to have really good Black Friday, Cyber Monday deals all next week. So tutorfair.com for that and englandcast.com slash tutorcon2020 for TutorCon tickets. So that's my ad. Thank you for listening. (laughs) So this episode is all about travel in Tudor England. It's something that I've been wanting to delve into for a while. About 10 years ago, I was out on a walk listening to an audiobook. And for the life of me now, I can't remember what it was. But it mentioned this kind of myth we have that people in pre-modern and early modern England and Europe didn't travel. You know, it reminds me of that whole kind of Monty Python sketch of the people digging in filth. There's some lovely filth over here and never going anywhere. I thought we lived in an autonomous collective. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you really need to watch Monty Python and the Holy Grail. That's all I can say about that. But that stereotype, like so many, is not actually strictly true. And the fact is that during the late Middle Ages and early Tudor period, people had the travel bug. It was harder to travel then than it is now, of course, but it doesn't mean that there weren't opportunities and that people didn't go anywhere. It was a bit harder for people in England, especially versus the rest of Europe, seeing as how England was an island, and it still is. I said that in the past tense as if it's not anymore, but (laughs) there were still opportunities and the population was much more mobile than we sometimes think. And also, I'm just going to put in a little note that the show notes for this episode are at englandcast.com slash travel. And I also did an episode about a year ago on Richard Hackleite, who was kind of the first travel writer in England. He was an Elizabethan. So if you want to go back and listen to that episode too, I'll put that in the show notes. So englandcast.com slash travel for all the show notes. So there were some professions that expected to have travel included in them. They were merchants. For example, merchants would go all the way to Antwerp. They would go down to Venice. They would go all over the place. They were very, very mobile. There were messengers, people in the military, especially if you went to war, you had a chance to kind of see the world. Missionaries and other religious leaders, nobles who had to go between their lands and court. There were tax collectors who had to go around collecting money, also traveling judges, So if you were in any way related to some of those traveling courts, if you were a clerk or anything like that, you were expected to travel. It's not five star, but beggars and vagrants were on the rise during this period because there were a lot of economic difficulties. Um, So those people did go around and travel and see new places and were much more mobile. Again, it wasn't a comfortable travel experience, but they were seeing places and it counts. 
Also, if you were a player, an, an actor, a minstrel, you would go around from town to town to town putting on your show, like the famous players of this time that would go from town to town and set up their shop, set up their play and put on their show for a couple of days, and then they would leave and go to the next place. Also, farmers even would travel. They would travel to local villages and also to the larger market towns to sell their produce. So people did get around. Now, for many, a pilgrimage was the best opportunity that you had to go out and see a bit of the world. It's one of the ways that the dissolution of the monasteries affected life for everyday people, because there, there weren't those relics to go see anymore. Now, in many ways, we actually still have these pilgrimages. It's something that seems to be innately human, that we want to go and see these relics and these places that are important to us. So, for example, how many of us have made a trip to see Strawberry Fields or Abbey Road? Or to walk the Hollywood Walk of Fame? Or, you know, go and put our handprint in our fa favorite actor's handprint on the Walk of Fame? These are things that seem to be uniquely human, this, this innate feeling that we have that we want to go and, and be part of something that we feel connected to. You know, how many times have you heard about, for example, a writer or a musician who goes to see an idol's home and comes away with a whole new level of inspiration for a book or for an album? Where I live here in Andalusia, there were a number of writers. Ernest Hemingway lived here, um, Orson Welles, a, a number of writers. And there's still writers who come and want to just walk in the streets that Hemingway walked in. So it's something that seems to be just really this unique human feeling that we have. So back in the Tudor period, people were going around to see relics of saints and to see things like the breast milk of the Virgin Mary and pieces of the true cross, things like that. We know that pilgrimage was incredibly important for people in late medieval and early Tudor England. Chaucer's great work, The Canterbury Tales, tells the story of pilgrims who are making their way to the shrine of Thomas Becket, each of whom have various reasons for travel, including the one woman who's hoping to meet her next husband on the road. In the ninth century, the remains of the apostle St. James were supposedly discovered in Galicia, and the way of St. James, or the Camino de Santiago, became a major route for pilgrims. Many people would be content to visit their own local shrine and pray and make requests of their own particular saint, but others wanted to go further afield. And in England, there was the very popular shrine of Our Lady Walsingham, which was meant to be an exact replica of the manger in which Jesus was born. So I did a mini cast on the shrine at Walsingham a couple of years ago, so I'll link to that in the show notes for this episode again as well at englandcast.com slash travel. But to be brief, it was created when a widow had a vision shortly after the Norman Conquest and believed that she was told by God to create this shrine to the Virgin Mary. People came from all over the country to pray there, especially for issues around childbirth and fertility. So after Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon had a son in 1511, for example, Henry went to give thanks at Our Lady of Walsingham, walking the final few miles barefoot, just as any penitent pilgrim would have done. His visit of Thanksgiving was premature, though, of course, as the baby lived only about six weeks. The shrine at Walsingham became so popular that the Milky Way actually became known as Walsingham's Way because it seemed to point to the shrine. But of course, if you could afford it, going abroad to Jerusalem or Rome was even more exciting, and people did make that trip. Soldiers traveled either up north to fight Scotland or to France. During the Crusades, people went to the Holy Land where they were blown away by the strange sights and sounds and smells that they found there. There was a saying that after Edward III's military victories in France in the mid-14th century, that every house in England had something from the French treasures taken during the fight, and many ships had to transport all the riches home. Now that's an exaggeration, but it is true that most of the soldiers would have come home with stories about France or a trinket or whether it was stolen or purchased. And you see pilgrims especially buying badges and souvenirs of their visits to relics. But soldiers also would have come home with prizes. And of course, like I said, religious people traveled, bishops and church leaders would visit the Pope or have conferences with other church leaders throughout Europe. And messengers and clerics were constantly on the move delivering messages and going back and forth. And then, of course, the nobles and some of their household would travel to visit their various estates or to attend parliament. So when people traveled, they did not use maps. In 1579, Christopher Saxton created a beautiful atlas of England. I'll put up pictures in the notes. But it was very big and it was very expensive and it was too big to travel with. Plus, it's still not particularly detailed. 
Instead, people would use an itinerary. This is really kind of showing my age, but I remember back in the day before there was Google Maps, when you were going on a trip, you used to go to AAA and get a triptych, which was kind of this little notebook that they would put together telling you the route along the way of each town you were going through and each exit you had to take off the freeway and things like that. And it was a very detailed step-by-step instruction. So people would use kind of things like that, um, this list of all the towns and the distances. And at each place, you would ask for directions to the next town. Traveling together would make this easier because one person in your group might know parts of the trip and be able to guide you better. And people would try to travel along rivers because they would more likely wind up in a town sooner that way because towns, of course, were along rivers. So you would try to travel the road close to the river so you could get to the next town. And there you would ask directions to the next one. In fact, when people thought about the routes and the geography, they did so in terms of rivers. So today we generally think about routes by roads. When I picture a map of, say, Southern California, in my mind, I'm thinking about freeways. I'm thinking about the 210 to the 605 to the 5 or the 101 to the 10 to the beach. Or in England, you think about the M25, things like that. So when the antiquarian John Leland was making a tour of libraries and religious houses, he spent 10 years traveling around and writing of his travels He talked about the rivers, and that was the context in which he viewed the country. He wrote about every river that he came across, including he described all the bridges and the streams that went off from them, the tributaries. He had this kind of fascination with the rivers, even writing poetry about them. Take this about the Thames. I too, I am persuaded, have heard through the dark shadows of the night the swans, as they attuned their strains in my own river where the silvery Thames bright earned wide spreading stream drenches his gray tresses with the swirling waters of the ocean. Isn't that beautiful? The silvery Thames. It's paint such a lovely picture. And you can actually read Leland's accounts of his travels online. A lot of it is free in places like Project Gutenberg. There's also a paperback version of his itinerary and travels. It's called the itinerary of John Leland in or about the years 1535 to 1543. I highly recommend that if you really want to get a sense of England during this time. And again, I'll put a link up in the notes. In terms of the bridges, there were some very large ones, like a 14-arch bridge in Stratford-upon-Avon. There was a 22-arch bridge over the Thames at Wallingford. But most are made of timber, and in some rural areas, they're only four or five feet wide. So you couldn't really get a cart across them. So there were actually several laws during this period addressing the improvement of the roads, but there didn't seem to be much point of fixing them up when you couldn't even get a cart across the bridge. So if you were traveling even along a really good road, and then you come to a river, and you can't get your cart across the bridge, what's the point of having a really good road, right? So the Bridges Act of 1530 empowered the local magistrates to make a determination as to who was responsible for the upkeep of each bridge in their area and to tax them if they did not keep it in good working order. But the problem with this is that bridges generally mark the boundaries between properties with one person owning land on one side of the river and the other person owning land on the other. So neither side wanted to take responsibility for the upkeep. And here we have this age-old question that we still debate today of benefit versus who's responsible for the upkeep. If a bridge benefited the total public, A landowner might think it's not his responsibility to pay for a bridge to keep the bridge in good condition when the entire town is using it. Like, why don't they all pay for it? When there weren't bridges available, there would often be ferries at larger rivers, like the Long Ferry, which travels up from the Thames from Gravesend to London, picking up people riding with the post from Dover and taking them into the city. It left in the morning and it would be in town by 2 p.m. or thereabouts, depending on the tide and the weather. There were also ferries that would take you across a river as well. So in London, you can cross the Thames for a penny. When you walk along from, say, Charing Cross over to the city, you can look down and see all these sets of stairs. And if you take a minute, you can actually imagine that there are these ferrymen with waiting boats right there, ready to take you over to the South Bank. If you wanted to go further than just going across, though, it will cost you more, of course. And it sometimes would be dependent on whether the tide was with you or against you. And that's how they would charge. So did you know that the use of the word road as a noun dates from around the 1560s? That's a fun fact. 
<laughs> More commonly, people would travel on highways, paths, lanes, streets, and ways. They didn't use the word road so much. And Ian Mortimer points out that when you travel along these roads today, especially like the Great North Road, you're going along the oldest man-made parts of the landscape in use since Roman times. And even in the cities, the main thoroughfares are built around the original Roman roads. So the roads themselves, like I said, followed the Roman roads, but the Roman roads had deteriorated, and so new ones had been built alongside them. But these roads had been built over time for people traveling on foot or on horse, not on coaches with iron wheels. The wheels could completely destroy the road because the vast majority weren't paved in any way. So people would put gravel in to soak up the mud in the main intersections, but for the most of the way, you'd be going over really deep ruts. The landowners who had land that bordered on the highway were supposed to maintain the ditches that would drain the road, but they didn't always do that. Again, it's this whole idea of who's paying for something versus who's benefiting. Main roads were meant to be kept up by the king or the monarch, the queen, so that he or she could move their armies and court around easily. But the side roads would be in awful condition, and you might often have to find another way around. In towns, there would be even more fun little things in the way, little obstacles in the way on the roads. Some people would stack their firewood, for example, under the eaves of their home, and it would spill out and block the road. People would also dig in the roads for sand or clay to repair the wattle buildings, and so there would be holes left in the road. And sometimes people would also dig wells right by the road. So drowning in one of these wells was actually a real risk. There were several acts of parliament to try to improve the roads. An act of 1555 established a process where church wardens in each parish could appoint two surveyors of the roads at Easter. They would announce four days in the year when all of the parishioners were expected to work to repair the roads, and every farmer had to send a cart with two men, every cottager had to work themselves, or else they would receive a very heavy fine. In 1563, the act was extended to restrict the size of gravel and sand pits, digging ditches beside the main roads, and allowing sur surveyors to take small stones from the quarries to mend the roads. It also increased the number of days to do road work to six instead of just the four. And then in 1576, a third act handled the repair of specific roads, and there are later records showing that the work was actually done and people were fined for not participating. So there was work done on the roads. Roadworks and construction were something that you would see a lot, but most of the side roads and the not main roads were still in pretty poor condition. So how did people travel? Of course, there were the horses and boats and your own two feet, and we'll talk about that. But people also used four-wheeled coaches more during this time. Four-wheeled coaches had been in use since the 13th century, but they were becoming more popular for gentry to use now as opposed to just the nobility and the royalty. Coaches were more popular throughout Europe than they were in England. So as the Protestant refugees came home early in Elizabeth's reign, they brought back with them the ability to drive and to manage the coaches. One man, William Boonen, came back from the Netherlands in 1564, and he so impressed Elizabeth with his driving skills that she made him her personal coachman. The queen seemed to be so impressed with coaches that she had four made for her between 1578 and 1586. And coaches became much less expensive during this time. The Earl of Essex used one that he valued at only eight pounds, though of course you still had to pay for the horse and feed the horse. You could rent a coach in London for about 16 shillings a day, plus food for the coachman and feed for the horses. And of course, just like today with driving, when you're driving around in your coach, you had to be very careful of accidents. In 1562, a 12-year-old girl was killed when a cart crunched her against the wall in Aldgate. Not pleasant. In John Stowe's famous survey of London, he wrote, then the number of cars carts and coaches, more than hath become accustomed, the streets and lanes being straightened must needs be dangerous as daily experience proveth. The coachman rides behind the horse, lashes carts, and looketh not behind him. The drayman sitteth and sleepeth on his dray, and letteth his horse lead him in this city home. I know that by the good laws and customs of this dangerous city, shod carts are forbidden to enter the same, except very reasonable causes as service of the prince or such like they be tolerated. Also that the fore horse of every carriage should be led by hand, but these good orders are not observed. 
Of old time, coaches were not known in this island, but chariots and whirlycoats, then so called, and they only used of princes or great estates. Such had their footmen about them. For example, to note, I read that Richard II, being threatened by the rebels of Kent, rode from the Tower of London to the Mile's End, and with him, his mother, because she was sick and weak in a whirlycoat. But now of late years, the use of coaches brought out of Germany is taken up and made so common that there is neither distinction of time nor difference of persons observed. For the world runs on wheels with many whose parents were glad to go on foot. In 1601, a bill was presented to Parliament to limit the use of coaches, but it was rejected. If you wanted to travel quickly, you would go on a horse. You would either buy one at a horse fair, paying at least three pounds for a good one. You could also buy a used one the same way we buy used cars today. You could also rent one. So if people knew you at the local inn, they would often have an extra horse you could rent, or you could rent one from the post routes. In 1516, Henry VIII appointed a master of the posts, and this was the very early forerunner of the Royal Mail. There were three postal routes in the country. One went out far as west as Plymouth, one going north to Berwick, and one going to Dover via Canterbury. And along each route were stations every 20 miles where you could hire a horse, paying a per mile fee. You could return it at the next station, or if you needed to go somewhere off the route, they would send someone to pick up the horse from your final destination at an additional fee, of course. By this time, there were a dozen or so types of horses available used for different types of uses from hauling and carrying, like a pack horse, to riding. How fast did people travel? If you were going a long distance and you needed to go quickly, you would have to change your horse on a regular basis. The post set a minimum speed of seven miles per hour on dry roads in the summer. And if a person had good weather and strong thighs for riding, they could go upwards of 75 miles a day easy, especially if they changed horses midway through. Someone traveling on foot, though, would be more likely to go about three miles an hour in good condition, so maybe 15, 20 in a, in a day. But of course, in bad weather, They might only be able to go a mile an hour and remember that they would have to stop to eat and rest. So that all took time as well. In late October 1599, a Thomas Platter described the great speed with which he traveled from Gravesend to Dover, which was a distance of 44 miles, which he did in just about five hours. But in the winter, with only about eight hours of daylight, and if you couldn't change horses, people would go even on horseback about two to three miles an hour. So the fastest record is in 1603 when Elizabeth I died, Sir Robert Carey was the person appointed to ride from London to Scotland to tell James that he was now the king. Woo! He left between 9 and 10 a.m. on the 25th of March. He reached Doncaster 162 miles away that night. The next day, he rode 136 miles to his house at Widrington. And on the third day, he fell, which resulted in bleeding from his head, But the man was unstoppable, and he rode on, going more slowly, but he still reached Edinburgh that night, 99 miles away. So he managed 397 miles in three days. And I would just like to take a moment to pause and consider how sore his butt was after that. (laughs) How much do you want to bet that he needed a break from riding horses for a long time? Traveling by road could be dangerous, of course, especially if you were on foot or your horse was tired. There are higher numbers of poor people and vagrants than before. Loyal listeners will remember an episode we did on the poor in Tudor England a couple of months ago and the attempts to address it. But for the purposes of our discussion here, we know that there are a lot of thieves in the roads that are hiding behind bushes to surprise the travelers. There were some laws that you were supposed to have each side of the road cleared 200 feet each way. But again, that meant the people had to maintain that. And so it wasn't really kept up. One example is between 1567 and 1602, accused criminals were tried for theft of over a thousand pounds in stolen items and money just in Essex. And that's just for 60 cases that actually made it all the way to court. Perhaps the most famous highwayman was Gamaliel Ratesey. He was actually born into a fairly well-to-do family, but he, quote, took to evil courses as a boy and became a thief. He became famous not just for the amount that he robbed, but also for his sense of humor. On one occasion, he robbed two wool merchants and knighted them by the roadside as Sir Walter Woolsack and Sir Samuel Sheepskin. Another time, he and his friends successfully robbed a large company of nine travelers, And before he relieved a Cambridge scholar of his property, 
he extorted a learned oration from him. I just, I think that's such a hilarious scene. I mean, I feel horrible for the the poor scholar getting robbed, but it it is pretty funny to imagine him having to stand there in his underwear and give a, a lecture on his particular expertise. Of course, he was almost like a modern day Robin Hood. He would give his money to the poor and not rob for them. But it only lasted for two years. And then his partners betrayed him to the law and he was hanged at Bedford in March of 1605. Often robberies would be entire communities working together. So let's say you're at an inn. Someone working at the inn would see that you had money and also would keep track of how many people were traveling in your group. So in the morning, you set off, and somehow, magically, the highwaymen know just where you are going and where you came from. So they surprise you in front of you, and then you turn around to try to run back to the town you just came from. And oopsies, there's people behind you too, so you're trapped. Another thing that highwaymen would do would be to switch the signs around. So there were supposed to be signposts and waymarks and things like that, but they could be easily moved. So they they would move them to lead the travelers to the wrong direction where they could then be surprised and robbed. But it wasn't all bad, of course, right? Or else business would never get done. These are just some very simple examples. But I think the gist of it here is to remember to see that people did travel. Travel was something that was an important part of people's life. And there were a lot of professions that required travel. There was a lot of ways that people could get out and see the world much more often than we might expect. So I hope that this episode sort of opened your eyes to that. If you want to dig deeper and learn more, the book recommendation is A Time Traveler's Guide to Elizabethan England by Ian Mortimer. I'll put a link up to that on the site. It's fantastic. A lot of these stories came from that book. There's also John Leland's um, travels and his itinerary, and there's Richard Hacolyte. So I'll put links up to all of that. Of course, you could get in touch with me through the listener support line at 8016 Tesco or through Twitter at Tesco or Facebook.com slash EnglandCast. I will be back in about 10 days or so next weekend with an episode on Tudor London. What was London like for our Tudor friends? So stay tuned for that. And remember to check out englandcast.com slash TudorCon 2020 to learn more about TudorCon and start planning your trip for next October. It's something like 315 days away or something like that. So it's not too early to start planning it. And especially, like I said, if you want to leave hints and give it as a Christmas gift, I'm happy to send a card to the right address too, so you can put that under the tree. And then tutorfair.com for all of your tutor gift giving needs. Um, There's some really cool new stuff up there that I'm super excited about. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your listenership, for your support, for your friendship. To all of those who came to TudorCon, I loved meeting you. It was so much fun. I can't wait to see you again next year. And um, yeah, I'll be back in about 10 days. (laughs) Thanks for listening. Blow, northern wind, send for baby sweating. Blow, northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoor to burn in Bauerbrich, that's all he said.